Thank you, Pastor Darian. It is good to see most of you tonight. Not all. Most. Um, like Darian said, my name is Tosh. That's not short for anything. That's the full name. Just Tosh. And not like point oh either. He's disgusting. I don't know. Just Tosh. Uh, I'm also referred to around these parts as Mr. Tammy. Um, my wife, Tammy, works here, and so I am here a lot, typically in the nursery on Sundays. My two favorite groups are one-year-olds and 18 to 25-year-olds, because they're a lot alike in the best possible way. They want to be loved, they need to be loved, and they are hungry for somebody to pour into them. That's why I like this group, right? So before we get started, I'd like you to pull out your cell phone, and we're going to play a little game. Hopefully we have time for it later. It's going to come up later. Go into your settings, into your screen time, and go back one week. One week, right? So I've been doing this little experiment for a while now, um, watching screen time. How many of you, how many, you've found it, everybody's there, right? All right, if you, everybody stand up, real quick, everybody stand up, and this is not to embarrass anyone, everybody stand up. If your average daily screen time is eight hours or more, sit down. Eight hours, and that happens, my wife says eight hours a day. Eight hours a day of screen time. Six hours or more, sit down. Six hours a day. Four hours a day or more. So everybody standing is under four hours of screen time a day. You realize you sleep six to eight hours and you should be working 10 to 12, right? We're running out of hours in the day. If your screen time is three hours or more, sit down. All right. Two hours or more, sit down. How many of your phones are brand new? So everybody here is two hours or more a day, right? I don't do that to embarrass you. I want you to lock it in, right? Just lock it in. Two hours or more per day of screen time. If you dig into that app, by the way, it will also tell you how many times you touched your phone. I touch my phone, in the last three weeks, I have touched my phone an average per week of 300 times, per week. My average screen time is 58 minutes a day. I will give anybody in here $1,000 if you have less social media time than me. You can't, because I don't have any. You're free to cancel me anytime you wish. Cannot be done, right? Now, just lock that away. I want you to hold on to that because we're going to jump into three scriptures. This week, Darren asked me to speak about what it means, what it looks like to be a good big brother, big sister, scripturally. So I started digging. This was a month ago. So I start digging. I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be good. This is going to be, let's do this. I like this. Let's, okay. Do you know there's no good examples in the Bible? Of what it means, Cain killed Abel, uh, Jacob stole Esau's blessing, uh, Jesus' brothers were mean to him. Like, there are no good examples of what it means to be a good big brother. God tells us what it means, but nobody ever walked it out, right? So I expanded it a little bit. So what I want to do today is talk to you about what it means to be a good big brother, big sister, slash friend, right? Now, here's the problem with the subject. Those words have an immediate connotation in your brain based on your siblings and your friends. It's kind of like when I talk about fatherhood. I love being a dad. I'm a dad to dozens and dozens of people. I'm legally a father to two people, but I'm a dad to dozens and dozens of people, right? Because I choose to be, okay? So I don't want you to think about 
that relationship that has tainted your view of brother, sister, friend, I want you to open up for a minute and we're going to dive into what it should look like. Say should. Should. So, if, let's start there. How many of you have a big brother, big sister? How many of you are the big brother, big sister? How many of you have a really great, I'm like world-class friend, best friend, right? Now, I'm fortunate. I have three amazing sisters. We're very close. Plus, I have five friends we grew up with that are brothers, and their parents are parents to me. So this subject is kind of easy for me to relate to because I have all those things. Now, here's what I want to ask. How many of you think you are a good big brother, big sister, slash friend? A good one. The numbers drop significantly. So what I want to ask you is if you've ever told your best friend, close friend, sister, brother, for, from now on, to save time, I'm just going to say brother, okay? It's all-encompassing person, brother, right? Because the Bible typically refers to it as a brother. Brother, sister, friend, we're going to call it a brother. How many of you have ever, as a brother, told that other person in your life, that is a terrible idea? How many of you have ever told that person, what in the hell are you doing? How many of you have ever told that person, I think you may be an idiot? Congratulations, you were a great brother. If you haven't said those words, you are a terrible brother. Terrible. I grew up, three sisters, they're all smarter than me. All my friends are smarter than me. Rule number one in life, surround yourself with people smarter than you. You will learn a lot, and you will feel better about yourself. Okay? Not at first. <laughs> but it will happen eventually. So, I'm sure we're going to go to Proverbs 18, 17 through 24. I'm sure most of you have heard this often misquoted scripture. A friend sticks closer than a brother. How many of you have ever heard that? And you've heard it said that way. A friend sticks closer than a brother. Well, guess what? That's not what it says. Now, when we read Scripture, or when I read it to you, I typically like to read more than what we're focused on because we, as Christians, should never be accused of cherry-picking Scripture to back up what we want to say. Right? So we're going to back up to Proverbs 18, 17 through 24. Yes, I'm old. I have to wear glasses to see you, but not the words on my paper. So, this is in the ESV. Verse 17. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. The lot puts an end to quarrels and decides between powerful contenders. A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like, a, is like the bars of a castle. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. The poor use entreaties, but the rich answer roughly. And here's the main one. A man of many companions may come to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So there's a couple scriptures in that about brotherhood. One is a man of many companions, a person who has lots of people in their life, they're going to come to ruin. Why? Why? Because we let the people in our life influence us one way or the other. So you got to be careful about who's speaking into your life. Number two, a friend sticks closer than a brother. That doesn't mean you can have one friend who's closer than a brother. 
I spent some time digging into this. Most theologians believe, and will you Google it, that a friend is none other than Jesus. Jesus sticks closer than a brother. But a man of many companions is going to sink. Why? Because a quarreling brother is like a city at war. If you go back to the top, it talks about what real brotherhood looks like. We're going to fight a lot. I'm going to call you an idiot a lot because I feel bad because you're smarter than me. That's what we do, right? So, a brother can be both a great source of comfort and a great source of misery, right? Because a friend, Jesus sticks closer than a brother. But our friends, brothers, sisters, they're either going to be there for us or they're going to just flat out make us mad, right? And we're going to obsess of it over it and get mad and say, why'd they do that? And we're going to stomp around, and then we're going to call all our other friends and say, can you believe so-and-so did such-and-such, and we should cancel them from now on, right? That's what happens. So, that being the question, what should we look for in a brother, sister, friend? So, should it be someone who shares our interest? Because you hear that a lot, you know, we're best friends because we were riding the bus together in sixth grade, and he had braces, and I had braces, and he was a dork, and I was a dork, and I was in band, and he was in the orchestra, and we had all the same interest, and he collected Pokemon, and I thought that was cool. No, I did not. Right? This is how the conversation typically starts. How did y'all become friends? We, we had all the same interest. Or is it Just somebody you can do life with, right? Because I'm 46. I have two kids, eight and nine, best kids in the world, a wife. We typically now have different friend groups because we're the old parents. All the parents of kids our age are 10 to 15 years younger than us. They tire us out. Like, man, I ain't running over there. I'm fat. I'm not doing it. You chase the kids. But friend groups, interest. They'll determine who your friends are, right? Who you can do life with. Then there's somebody that you admire. Some, you want to be friends with that person you admire. Like you see somebody, their, their, their life is goals, right? They got it going on and you admire them. And then when they know your name, all of a sudden you're like, Oh, they know my name. And that's how attraction begins, because it's the praise of the praiseworthy. Whoever I find to be praiseworthy, once they show me praise, is like, yeah, we're friends. I know that guy. He knows my name. Does he know your birthday? Question. Does he know your last name? Can he spell your name? Does he know anything, right? These are things we look for in friends. Here's what we don't look for in friends. Guarantee, you may not admit this out loud, but I know. You definitely don't want someone to be your friend that's more attractive than you, smarter than you, happier than you, wealthier than you. Why? Because if somebody is an er or an est, that puts you down here. They're smarter. They're the smartest. You're down here. Nobody wants to be down here. That's the praise of the praiseworthy. We find praise up here and we go, I'm going to be that dude's friend. Right? And then we start ignoring all the other people God has put in our life to pursue the er and the est. Right? And we look to make up those shared interests Oh, you have brown shoes too. What a coincidence. It happens, right? So, let's hit the pause button there, and we're going to go see what Jesus says about life. So, we got friends, or we don't have friends, and then we're going to go see what John tells us Jesus said about life in John 16, 32, 33. Behold, this is Jesus talking, okay? 
Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So this is what happens. You, you go through life looking for that brother, friend, sister. Why do you want them? Praise of the praiseworthy. Praise of the praiseworthy is all about pride. It makes you an er and an est. Right? It elevates you. And then the words of Jesus come to fruition. In this world, you will have trouble. And all of a sudden, those people who you thought were your friends don't even know that you're in trouble. And they said, well, had you reached out to me, I would have been there for you. If you would have put it on the gram, I would have known. Let me hit pause right there. June 19th, my dad fell and hit his head, and he is unconscious and has been since June 19th. He has been in neuro ICU in Houston. You know, I don't have social media. You know, Pastor Darian reached out to me. Said, let's go to breakfast. Tell me what's going on. I walk in, Pastor Jake gives me a hug and says, I love you. What can we do? Pastor Will stops me on Sunday, said, We just prayed for your dad. We'll be there for whatever you might need. Friends don't have to have social media to tell them what their friends are going through. Family knows what family is going through. Whether you say it or not, how do you know? Because when I walk in the room and my friend sees me, oh, something's wrong. You can see it on your friend. When I walk in and my sister sees me, she knows if I'm having a good day, if I'm having a bad day, if I feel good, if I feel bad, what I'm thinking and why I'm thinking it. Why? Because she has spent 46 years years sowing into my life. In this world, you will have trouble. The good news is, Jesus says, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. How many of you, when you're going through the stuff, really want to be quoted Scripture to? I tell you what, there's times where people get so churchy, I want to punch them in the face. Like, when you're going through the stuff, I would rather Pastor Jake do what he did, give me a hug and say, I love you. Then I would somebody come, you know, the Lord won't give you more than you can handle. I hate that saying. I despise it. Right? I cannot stand it. The Lord sees on high what you're going through. Well, he better get his tail down here and help me. Because I need help. Yeah, he's overcome the world. But you know what? When you're in the world, it's real hard to see the finish line. In the middle of the stuff, it's hard to see out of the pit. And you got to have somebody who comes along and says, I know you. I know you. And that's enough. Right? So, what I want you to focus on here is what Jesus says. In this world, you will have trouble. Jesus promises that you will have problems. You're going to have problems. He promises you that you will make bad choices. Most of your problems are going to be your fault. They're going to be your fault. I didn't get fat by accident. It didn't happen. This does not exercise. My high blood pressure is not my wife's fault. It's bad choices. No, bald is Jesus' fault. <laughs> it is. But you know what? All people in heaven are bald. Just a glorified body on earth as it is in heaven. So, Jesus says you will do the wrong thing. You will be tempted. 
you will face lust, desire, greed, pride, prejudice, anger, injustice, hatred, and lies. You'll face it all. And then he throws in, but don't worry. I've overcome the world. And he has. And you should find hope in that. But in the middle of it, it's real hard for us to encourage ourselves. David encouraged himself. David had the heart of God. Heart after God. I'm not David. I'm more Saul than David. You know, there's a funny thing about the Bible. We all want to identify with David and all the heroes of the Bible. I'm here to tell you, you're not David, you're Goliath. You're not David, you're Mephibosheth. The only time you're David is when he's on the roof looking at Bathsheba. And sometimes you're Bathsheba subject to David. And life gets hard. Right? So, what is a friend supposed to do about it? Big brother, sister, friend. Well, we say that, you know, if Zach, I'm going to pick on Zach because Zach loved me, right? If Zach really loved me, he would understand and he would love me unconditionally through that moment. Absolutely. That's 100%. Zach should love me unconditionally. The problem is, is what we have been conditioned to think in our worldview is what that unconditional looks like, right? So unconditional today tends to look something like, Zach must encourage me in my moment of weakness and tell me everything's going to be all right, that it's not my fault, that I did nothing wrong, that the world is against me, and if I sue enough people, I can get out of it. That's not unconditional love. What biblical love looked like and unconditional worldview love are completely different things. So I want to go, this is very long, but it's very good. I want to jump over to 2 Corinthians 3, 17, 7 through 18, right? But, this is Paul writing, okay? But if the ministry of death, because that's what we're talking about, right? The world kills us a little bit every day. When we have a bad day, it feels like we're dying, depending on the breadth of the bad day, right? Written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? What Paul's talking about here is when Moses went up on the mountain, he told God, I want to see your glory. And God said, if you saw my glory, you'd die, son. So I'm just going to let you see the fading back of me as I walk past you. Hide in this cleft of the rock, and I'm going to tell you when, and you get to go. That's it. That's all you get is a. And when it did, his face was so lit up when he came down the mountain. So dude saw the backside of God, climbed down a mountain, which took days, and is walking through Israel, and people are like, oh, my God. We put a, put a, put a mask on, and not a COVID mask, like cover your whole face. At that time, his glory had already begun to fade from Moses' face, and it was so radiant the Israelites could not look upon it. For if the ministry of the condemnation had glory, the minister of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. If you thought that was a lot, wait till Jesus comes back. For even when was made glorious, had no glory in this respect, because there's a lot of glories in here, because of the glory that excels. For, for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains, uh, remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on our hearts. 
Nevertheless, when one one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord Lord is, there is liberty. First song we sang today. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of, of the Lord. So what does a friend do? What does a big brother, sister, friend do? That's a really long scripture with a lot to unpack that I have not enough time to do, so we're going to skip a page of notes, right? And I'm going to sum it up right here. What is our job as a friend? We can't be a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We're that friend who wars with our friend and gets behind bars in the first part of Psalms. Honestly, that's who we are. We're supposed to try and be like Jesus. So when the world has come against us and you do have trouble and God has overcome the world, according to that, what is our job? It lies in the very end. We're supposed to hold a mirror up to our friend and say, you are going from glory to glory. Now, we have a slight problem because glory is a big word. Anytime you open a Strong's and you see a word has been translated to 13 different things, we have a problem because the translators can't fully define the word, right? So I want to tell you, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, glory was kabod. It meant heaviness. It meant weight. When the glory of the Lord came, there was weight, right? In the Greek, it's, it, the word is doxa, and it means brightness, splendor, radiance, magnificence, greatness, Honor, recognition, renown, and prestige. That's a lot of words. So when we say you hold a mirror up to him and say you go from glory to glory, are we saying you go from weight to weight? No, I'm already there. Right? What we do is hold a mirror up to him, and this, if we take the entire countenance of Scripture together and try and define glory, it rolls everything together and we say, Glory refers to the weighty, manifested presence of God and the reaction on earth to that presence, right? Because we read in the Old Testament, and his glory filled the temple, right? But then we read later, the angels sing glory to God in the highest. So it's both a present, right? It's a presence, and it's a posture, right? The other cool thing is, do you know what raised Jesus from the dead? Romans 6, 4 says, Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And Paul tells us, we go from glory to glory. There are days where I'm in the two. Not the glory and the glory, but I'm in the two. That's the in this world you will have trouble. Because there are days I do not feel the manifested weighty presence of God and I don't feel like singing glory. There's thousands of songs written throughout time about the glory of God. They even call heaven glory. As I entered the gates of that city, they sing songs about glory. His glory me there right you could do that all day and never bring glory to God you could sing beautifully and never bring glory to God ever you could also fall on your knees weep like a child and let the glory fill the room you cannot manifest create invoke or persuade the glory of God to enter the room. But yet God says, you go from glory to glory. You go from my weighty manifested presence in which I can do and am all things in your life to my weighty manifested presence which I can be, do, and all things in your life and get out of the two. But how do we do it? 
because we already established when you're in the middle of the bad things will happen to you, you don't always want a churchy answer. You don't want somebody to walk up to you and put their arm around you and say, you know, if you just would repent from your sin, God would hear you and heal you and make your life better. No sin of mine caused my dad to fall and hit his head. My dad fell and hit his head because he's 73 years old, stubborn, and a mule, and we live in a fallen world. That's why my dad's in a hospital. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. But God has seen fit to put people in my life to hold up a mirror to me in this two and a half weeks and say, here, look here. Do you know what God sees? He sees Jesus. Scripture tells us that because of the work on the cross, God doesn't see you when he looks at you. He sees Jesus when he looks at you. That's how you go from glory to glory. You can be in the two and God sees Jesus. You just need a friend to hold up a mirror up to you and say, God sees you. And it's going to be okay. It may not feel okay. The world may come to an end. You may never get the justice you're looking for, but guess what? We have a hope and a future, and it's not in this world on this side of the cross. That is going from glory to glory. And I want it, it wouldn't be me if I didn't go Old Testament. I want to show you how it works, okay? And I'm not going to read all the scriptures to you because I have two minutes, right? So everybody stand for the last two minutes, and we'll wrap this up. Back in uh, 1 Samuel 15, King Saul. I told you I'm more Saul than David. King Saul has been sent on a mission to invade the Amalekites. And Samuel tells him, kill them all, Saul. Every sheep, every goat, the king, everybody. Everybody. Kill them all. And then Saul, Samuel gets there. And Saul kept the king, and he kept the choices of animals, and he kept all the good stuff. And Saul, super excited, said, Samuel, we did it! The Lord has prevailed on our behalf, and we smote the Amalekites. I like the word smote. Smote the Amalekites, and I did everything you said. And Samuel says, what is this bleating that I hear? This day, Saul, God has removed the kingdom from you. Now, Saul had a chance. Saul had every chance in the world. And what did he do? The men made me do it, and I was afraid for my life. Later, he goes to attack the Philistines, and Samuel says, wait for me, don't go. Samuel's one day late. Maybe a little more, I forget. And he goes, and Saul offers the burnt offering. And Samuel gets there and goes, what have you done? That's not your job, bro. That's a terrible idea. And Saul says, you were late. And then he's, Samuel tells him, the Lord would have put your heir on the throne of Israel forever. What does that mean? It means Jesus would have been from the tribe of Benjamin, not David. Then you have David. Up on his rooftop, chilling, watching Bathsheba, being a perv. He sleeps with her. He gets her pregnant. He has her husband killed. And Nathan shows up and tells him a long story we don't have time to get into about a sheep, etc. And David said, who is this man? I'll kill him. And Nathan says, it's you. That was a terrible idea, David. And what does David do? Simple. In, in Hebrew, it's two words. But it means, I have sinned against the Lord. That's all he does. And Nathan then says, the Lord has removed his anger from you and you will not die. So what does the mirror look like today? You make a terrible decision. Sometimes you're a Saul, sometimes you're a David. The Samuels and the Nathans come to you and they hold the mirror up in front of you and say, Take a look. 
Are you going to make excuses? Are you going to say, well, I mean, this is the culture we live in. I'm just, I'm just doing my part. This is it. This is how we do life now. Generationally, you're old. Culturally, we're beyond you. Or are you going to look at your friend and go, I know you slept with all five girls. You're not married to any of them. You need to repent. Sometimes you're a Nathan. Sometimes you're a Samuel. Sometimes you're going to be both a David and a Nathan. You got to know which side of the mirror look you're looking at and what to do when you're looking in the mirror. It's not easy. But it's the only answer to in this world you will have trouble. Because as much as we'd like to say you're going to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get yourself out of it, you're not. Why? Because God put people on this earth for relationship. He didn't have people and he created you. He likes you. He didn't have other people. He created them. He likes them and he puts you together in this time, in this space, for this season to do the work of the kingdom in this place. And it doesn't work if you can't look in the mirror. And it doesn't work if you can't hold the mirror. Because you are going to mess up. You're going to make terrible decisions. But can you have the strength to look in the mirror and say, I have sinned against the Lord? And do you have the strength to be a Nathan and say, God forgives you? You don't have the power to forgive anybody. But it's our job when somebody's down to go, God forgave you. And he sees Jesus when he sees you. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day and this time, for this season that you have placed us together. Lord, we ask that you bless us, that you move David's and Saul's and Samuel's and Nathan's in and out of our lives, Father God. That we, we would love you, that we would seek you in the hard times, and above all else, that somehow we would be able to show your glory on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.